This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, so my training is as a plant systematist, and I'm speaking on ethnobotany. Uh, and I guess I will just preface this talk saying, I have some credentials in the ethno part of this since I have an undergraduate degree in anthropology. Uh, and I crossed over and through ethnobotany into botany, became totally confused by all the plant names and uh, made a career out of it. And later in my career, I had some opportunities being in Oklahoma and collaborating with paleoethnobotanists and other ethnobotanists to do some research. So there's a lot of serendipity in research and I, I really like this project. It was very different than other things I've done and I, I think it has some merit and you can be the judge of that. So we're really focusing on three tribes, which I'll make a case for as being uh, a good window to look at an overall view of ethnobotany of the Southern Plains. So we're trying to reconstruct, in many respects, traditional knowledge. So that's a difficult task. And with each generation, more and more information gets lost. So it's very challenging in many respects. Okay, just to start off at a general level, ethnobotany defined, it's just interactions between cultures and people, plants and people, however you wanna define it. Uh, and Richard Schultes, a lot of you should be familiar with that name, is often called the father of modern ethnobotany. And there is an Oklahoma connection if you're familiar with Schultes. So, and this is my shout out to undergrads. Here's Schultes on the end, if I can't see where this thing is. Okay. He's on your left. That's the end of his junior year, going into his senior year at Harvard. He did a three months uh, senior thesis research with an anthropologist in Oklahoma, where he spent time with the Kiowa. And at that time, nobody had made any kind of inventory of plants used by the Kiowa. Oh, they were buffalo hunters, end of story. Well, a lot more complicated. Uh, and then obviously that led into an incredible career as somebody who basically defined the field of ethnobotany. He spent 12 years in the Amazon. If you're more interested in following up on this, the classic book by Wade Davis, One River, uh, is a good depiction of that time spent uh, based on his journals. A lot of his photographs are in a book called The Lost Amazon, also uh, put together by Wade Davis. And then there's a movie, just the only cinematic uh, portrayal of Schultes that I'm aware of, uh, Embrace of the Serpent. It's a film from Colombia, uh, nominated for Best Foreign Film uh, at the Academy Awards. So a very interesting uh, individual and really significant. Okay, so let's get back into the Southern Plains. We're not in the Southern Plains here, unless I click my heels together. Uh, anyway, eco-geographical setting. The shaded area from an eco-region uh, perspective is the South Central uh, semi-arid prairie ecosystem. Uh, geographers often have a cutoff of the Central Great Plains and the Southern Great Plains. I'm mostly concerned with the Southern Great Plains. And you can see basically where the Plains Apache, the Kiowa, and the Comanche uh, fit in that geographic and eco-geographical scheme. What's going to be particularly significant, and unlike many of the tribes represented in Oklahoma, the KCA, as they are often referred to, Kiowa, Comanche, Apache, uh, this was their native territory. So they shrunk their territory and other major changes happened, but they weren't transported in here like the Cherokee and other southeastern tribes. Whoops. Okay, so let's look at the cultural landscape. So what we have in here is a little map, uh, and the tribes in red were basically nomadic hunting and gathering tribes. So they hunted bison, but they did more than hunt bison. They gathered plant materials and other natural resources. The agrarian hunting economies are in blue. So really, in the southern plains, it was really a Kiowa, the Comanche, and the Plains Apache. 
And you can see a hatched area taking in the panhandles of Oklahoma and Texas was their original reservation. Of course, that's much too large. So two years later, they shrunk the res. And then you had the small area. And then 1901, they basically eliminated the reservation. Uh, some of our early images are by George Catlin. And you can see an image of Comanche bison hunting there, as well as a Kiowa encampment. So I maintain, and I'm, that's my thesis, that the KCA are an ideal group to study the Southern Plains ethnobotany for several reasons. They've been geographically contiguous, really, for a couple hundred years. They had a similar economic base, which was basically hunting and gathering. They had a close association since Euro-American contact. And they actually confederated politically under the Medicine Lodge Treaty of 1867. So from a cultural, eco-geographic, and economic strategies, they were very similar, and there was much intermarriage. Now these were very disparate tribes linguistically. So to put these in a linguistic context, each of those tribes, their language is in a different language family. So how did they communicate? Of course, they Many peoples living in different parts of the world learn multiple languages, unlike Americans. <laughs> this is part of their growing up because they have to interact with people. They also use sign language quite a bit, which came in very useful on one of my field trips when I was with a 96-year-old Apache elder who had no hearing, and his son communicated by sign language. So they have a shared cultural heritage. In 1700, the Plains Apache were closely allied with the Kiowa, which they've kept up all these years. That's where a lot of the intermarriages, particularly between the Kiowa and Apache. In fact, for decades, the Apache weren't even known about. They were just assumed to be some group of Kiowa. And then they called them the Kiowa Apache, uh, and more uh, correctly referred to as the Plains Apache. It is a dialect different from some of the other Apache groups. Uh, 1806, the Kiowa and Com uh, Comanche made peace. 1885, they were actually forced to settle. A familiar story in American Indian history. Uh, 1867, they became confederated, and then it was like, there's another tribe in here. <laughs> so it became the KCA, reservation in Canada, the KC. Uh, by 1886, the American bison was functionally extirpated, and this is significant because by being restricted and being basically forced to become ranchers or farmers, which they were not, uh, their economic base evaporated. So that's one way to destroy a culture is to destroy its economy. Uh, the Dawes Act was uh, enacted later, which eliminated a lot of communal lands, which mean uh, families were given individual plots, which left a lot of leftover land, which was then open for settlement. Uh, and the reservation dissolved in 1901. So these are very, very significant. And of course, if you talk to any of these groups, uh, I'm not doing it justice and just uh, going over in such a short period of time. Okay, so let's look at the reservation area. And there's the, in red, the outline of the reservation, which they uh, were in until 1901. And this is where most of the tribal peoples that haven't relocated actually are today. And that's where tribal headquarters are. So they were forced to settle on the reservation, home territory restricted. They were restricted to family allotments. So a dramatic change, particularly when they weren't farmers or ranchers. Uh, there are no bison, and it's a very sad point in their history. A very proud people have to fight for scraps thrown off the back of a wagon, basically. And traditional knowledge, of course, lost in every generation. A familiar, familiar story. So let's look at the objectives of this. This is really more of a meta-analysis where I've taken data and then tried to assemble it and then do different analyses with the data. In this case, the raw data are plantless, use of plants. So I wanted to reconstruct their floristic and ethnobotanical resources to get that kind of baseline, look at their use patterns, in a floristic context and in an ethnobotanical context, like how many plants did they use? I mean, what percentage of the flora? How does this compare to other groups, et cetera? 
and test some hypotheses on recorded versus potential economic plant resources, underreporting of economic plant use, and loss of traditional knowledge. These are difficult things to get at, but um, it's something that anthropologists, social sciences, and ethnobotanists have to deal with. And I mean, in some respects, we're reconstructing things in scientific research. We try to get data and then we try and make inferences that are consistent with that data and propose hypotheses. Okay, the methods, compiling the economic plant data from the few surveys that are out there, from some direct uh, communication with some of the tribal members uh, and other scattered sources in the literature, sometimes uh, almost anecdotal. And that's the trouble with any meta-analysis. You can have different kinds of data and you kind of have to standardize it and bring it in and try and figure it out. Uh, reconstruct floors for the South Central Prairie ecoregion as well as for their reservation. And a lot of this relied very heavily on the databases listed at the bottom. So we can't underestimate the, the value of some of these databases. And it, it's uh, invaluable. I could not do this kind of work otherwise, and as most people who use uh, databases and those resources. Uh, the Native American ethnobotany database in particular was very useful for looking at tribal and plant resources. Okay, now I was fortunate, and this also kind of initiated the study, in that there were three uh, important surveys of these, this group. In particular, the Plains Apache, you'll notice Judy Jordan published a book in 2008. And I was instrumental in working with her. She had done her work in the early 1960s, three summers of intensive field work and was granted a master's degree. Uh, if, and her master's thesis was signed out by people all over the country. Why this woman did not get a PhD is a sad story. <laughs> but anyway, and she lived less than a mile from where I live. So I hooked her up, she got her notes together and she published it. So I was very pleased with that. But there's Schulte's book. So three months going into his senior year, ended up with a critical publication and really the best summary of the plants used by the Kiowa. The Comanche, a group out of Michigan, they had a Michigan archaeological summer station there. Olney Jones was the botanist, I believe. Those vouchers are at Michigan. The Schulte's ones are at Harvard and Judy Jordans are at Oklahoma. So let's get into some of the summary of the data. Okay. So I was able to pull these data and quantify it. So if we look at the Kiowa, we can verify about 88 species were recorded. The Comanche is much less, 68. Uh, and so I spent more time looking through the Michigan vouchers, which were actually not in the Michigan herbarium, but were in the anthropological collections. Uh, and luckily I was able to uh, identify some of the vouchers, but some of the vouchers were fragments of wood. Uh, and I did not identify some of those. And the Plains Apache, which actually took place over three years, had a much greater number. <coughs> So there's some lessons there in terms of field work, in terms of uh, informants, et cetera. Because Judy had multiple informants, male and female, over multiple summers from different family groups, uh, as opposed to one or two male informants during a three month period. So let's look at the totals. I was able to look at the species present in at least one tribe, about 175. And Species recorded for use among all tribes. So we have three ethnobotanical surveys. Only 17 of those are recorded in all three tribes. So a lot of these data only appear in one survey. Most of these are native to the Southern Plains, 94%, 164. Five were na native to North America, but are found outside the region and are mostly through trading. They were significant plants from the South or West mostly. And there were also 
some exotics, species not native, six species. So I like this graphic, and other individuals have as well, because I think it visually portrays uh, the effect of an obviously related group that shared a lot of the same knowledge of their resources uh, and how little overlap there was from independent researchers doing these surveys. So here's the number of species for the Kiowa, the Apache, and Comanche. Here's the 17 that were shared. And then you can see some are shared between the Apache and the Kiowa, some are in surveys in the Comanche and Kiowa, and then 35 between the Apache. So by portraying it this way, you realize that a lot of the information really just surfaced in one ethnobotanical survey which means a lot of the information which was probably there was not, was forgotten by some of the informants or was not recorded or whatever. Sometimes it's proprietary in, in the case of healing plants, etc. Let's look by category. So there's lots of things you can do once you get these kind of data. So these are species used in at least one tribe out of the 175. A large portion of that are edibles. And that makes sense. This is the major supplement to the protein source being primarily bison meat, not exclusively. Ritual or medicinal plants, also a major, major category. This is not surprising. This is through the most ethnobotanical research. Uh, a large number, again, used for material culture. This is quite important as well. Personal care and adornment, uh, it drops off quite a bit as you might suspect, but most of the, many plants had multiple uses. They could be edible, could, a component or a different plant part could be used medicinally. Some of it could be used materially. So edible plants, and in this category, I'm keeping it with broad strokes. So we have foodstuffs, beverages, masticatories, additives, 91 species. Uh, a lot of these have underground parts. Uh, another major proportion, more than half, used reproductive parts, fruits, seeds, uh, and 20 species, sap, stems, leaves, etc. And two common ones, which you're familiar with as well here, would be Rus glabra, which is widespread, and Nufar lutea as well, which is widespread. Material culture is very important. Uh, and if you don't think it is, see how well you survive out there without not just your iPhone, everything else that we purchase. <laughs> Construction materials, dyes, fibers, resins, miscellaneous products, a major, major category. Fibers, yucca glauca, which is also multiple use, and so a lot of that was edible as well. Uh, the young stems, which are kind of like asparagus, as well as the blossoms, are edible. And then the fibers. And uh, a rough leaf dogwood, which is common in that region, uh, which often produces a lot of stems from a crown uh, that are equal diameter, so they make good arrow shafts. And ritual medicinal plants, many of these are quite well known, uh, used such as echinacea, widely, widely used, not just in this region. Peyote, uh, peyote has been in use for thousands of years. Uh, and remember, the Comanche were part of the KCA, and they were really widespread. I mean, the Kiowa too, but the Comanche roamed all over from Mexico up to the northern plains. Uh, and a lot of what they did is take bow wood and other things, and they would trade. Uh, but they got exposed to peyote, uh, introduced it in the Oklahoma. So the Oklahoma-based tribes, the KCA, as well as the Cheyenne Arapaho, were very critical in introducing peyote and in development of the Native American church. White sagebrush, which is also uh, well known here, is widely used. Personal adornment, personal care, not so many species. Monarda fistulosa, this is a mint, remember the Lamiaceae, uh, commonly used as a perfume. In those hot southern plain summers, a perfume could be a good thing. If you walk through this, it's very, very aromatic with lots of 
volatile terpenoids. Escalbene, this is actually a psychoactive plant, but a particularly dangerous plant. It's a legume. You can see a, a low med there, like a peanut. Uh, but these are very toxic, and it's very difficult to uh, modulate the amount taken without it being catastrophic, kind of like jimson weed, very similar. And Cytoids gramma, Budalua, uh, very interesting in the sense that the, the second or all the inflorescences on one side of the stem look very similar to warlands, and it was very common as an ornament, particularly in ceremonies. Many of these had multiple uses. Uh, two of the most common ones would be the cacti, Opuntia, which are abundant in this region, edible material culture, Ritual medicinal, uh, as well as black walnut. Plenty of black walnuts here. There's another species of walnut too, the small fruited walnut, microcarpa. Edible material, culture, ritual medicinal, multiple uses for these plants. So I just want to go through a couple of plants and then we'll look at the data from a couple of different perspectives. So some of the representative plants, the junipers, and Juniperus virginiana, uh, people are familiar with. This is the structural material for a lot of uh, teepees and things of that nature. As you get away from the Rockies, you don't have lodgepole pine, hence the name lodgepole, uh, but you can use the cedars. But there's a western cedar on limestone that pops up. And I'm particularly pleased with this one because I found this out by really talking to a couple of the elders in the Apache and they took me to a spot where they had a different cedar with a different smoke, uh, obviously a different terpenoid composition and a different colored fruit, the bear, you know, the cones. Uh, and I went there and as soon as I saw it, I knew it was Pinchodii. So we were able to actually add that to the list. And that was on a sacred mountain. So. I felt very privileged. I went there with the 96-year-old uh, ex-chair uh, of the tribal council uh, who couldn't climb the hill, but he wanted to see it one last time because he only lived three months after that. And he was the last native speaker for that dialect. But the museum at the University of Oklahoma has a very active program of recording uh, languages and stories by native speakers and so he, there's quite an audio library uh, for that Plains Apache dialect because his son who I knew knew songs and knew some plants but had no idea what the songs meant or what the plants were used for so that's a good example of just one generation loss of traditional knowledge. Uh, Bow Dark or if you're from Texas Bow Dark <laughs> Osage Orange, this is a member of the Moraceae and Mulberry family. This is the preferred wood for bows, particularly a mixture of the heartwood with the sapwood, that interface. Uh, and you split the wood radially. And this was the preferred bow wood throughout the Plains region. Walnuts, little and black, the microcarpa, as well as Nigra juglans. Uh, and very widely used, and they appreciated its beauty as well. It is arguably one of the most beautiful made of North American woods. And here's a Kiowa cradle board. That's quite spectacular as well as being functional. White sagebrush, very, very well known, including in this region, Artemisia ludoviciana. Uh, there's a plants database map. I guess you don't have it if you're up in Alaska, but other than that, widely, widely used. And I guess in Alabama, people are missing out on this. <laughs> I won't comment on that further. <laughs> okay, Indian breadroot. This is the last of these I'll show. A very, very critical plant. Uh, it's still fairly abundant in the Northern Plains, so a lot of the Sioux uh, have these plants uh, and, and include them in their ceremonies. But... Uh, it's getting much more difficult to find in the Southern Plains. Very important edible. But there are six plants not native to North America. Wormwood, dandelion, watercress, sweet clover, Johnson grass, and yet they were used uh, quite a bit. So when plants became introduced 
and the native peoples found them, if they knew of a use, that knowledge spread and they incorporated it into their repertoire. So I know a lot of these have been around a long period of time, so they were significant. Many of these plants used by the KCA were also used outside of the Southern Plains. Usually, um, it depends on the, the natural distribution of the plants. Most of the KCA plants are gonna be uh, plants found in the North American prairie and the Southwestern or Sonoran floristic provinces. But, so Yucca glauca, as you can see, which is mostly uh, mid-continent, has a mid-continent tribal use pattern. Western soapberry, much more southwestern. Uh, you pick up the popgo as well as the KCA. And Roos Glaber is used by a multitude of tribes, reflecting its distribution. Now, if we look at the archaeological record, and a lot of these records are come from the flotation method, a lot of these are charcoalified. Uh, you have 75 plants from this Great Plains in the archaeological record. And for those who may not be familiar, it's generally divided into the Paleo-Indian, basically 10,000 years and older, the Archaic period, to about 1,000 BCE, Woodland, and then the Plains Village, merging into the modern. So that's your scale. And if we look at some of the case... CA species that are in the archaeological record. Most of this data, these data are by genus only. It's very difficult to define, to identify a lot of species that are charcoalified. Uh, so 47 uh, appear in the archaeological record. If we go back in time, the Plains Village, Woodland, Archaic, Paleo, we can see you drop off the number of plants, but there's five plants still used that have been in use for much greater than 10,000 years. And that's pretty impressive. The other thing that's interesting is there's several species in the record that don't show up in the KCA record. So if we look at goosefoot, kinopodium, uh, that is a KCA plant, uh, carbonized and sumpweed in the sunflower family, Iba annua, very widespread throughout its range historically in the paleo ethnobotanical record. No record for the KCA. But that's true for many cultures. It seems that once corn came in, they dropped a lot of these grains that were more like famine foods. So these are the five plants that have a greater than 10,000 year record, which I find pretty impressive. Goosefoot, choke cherry, seralce, which you may not be familiar with, remember the mallow family. Uh, sunflower, as well as a puntia. So if we summarize the botany the, in an ethnographic context, we'll see that there's a wide variety of plants used. Okay, there are a lot more than just bison, monolithic bison hunters. Uh, and a lot of the plants used are used by other tribes. So there was a lot of communication, shared knowledge, uh, which makes, has good survival value and makes perfect uh, sociological sense. There's a long history of usage for many of these plants, thousands of years in the region, even with the ebb and flow of different cultural groups. So I'm proposing that the combined data, particularly given the nature of ethnobotanical surveys, result in a much more complete view of the plants used by the individual tribes and probably is a more accurate reflection of their collective knowledge base of plant resources. So of course, once you get this, there's a lot of other questions. How many plants did they use? How thorough are some of these surveys? I've kind of partially answered that question. And the real tricky one, how can we estimate loss of traditional knowledge? Uh, other than saying, traditional knowledge is lost in each generation, which it obviously is, but it's difficult to kind of quantify some of these or get a more robust uh, hypothesis. So I reconstructed the floor of the KCA res. Uh, this is where the databases come in and came up with 1,289 species for this uh, seven county region in southwestern Oklahoma. I was mostly concerned with the natives. So that's a fair
fair number. I also went in, which was a lot more challenging, and tried to reconstruct the native floor of the southern South Central Great Plains ecoregion. The floor of the Great Plains was of limited use because of the region that it covers and incorporates the northern plains as well. Uh, so I came up with 28 and 39 native species there, 1289 native species for the res. Uh, and then looking at those reservation plants with economic uses elsewhere in North America, 508 are recorded. So almost two out of five plants on that reservation had some documented history of use by Native Americans. Two out of five. Now, there's a lot of grass species in there, a lot of legume species, a lot of asteraceae species, but two out of five uh, were useful, and that's pretty remarkable. Now, not all of those were used, but that's the potential resource. So in the South Central Plains, you see a much smaller percentage, about 6%. And I'm sure the, no, the numbers were much larger, but with their range restriction, uh, a lot of that extra reservation flora was probably forgotten. Uh, and they used 164 native plants that I can document out of 1289, and that's 12.7%. Now that's the figure that's actually very similar to well-documented ethnobotanical surveys elsewhere in the world, but it's hard to get that kind of data because of the tribal, whatever group you're studying is part of a larger region and they don't just have a flora. The closest example would be a Pacific island where you have a discrete flora and a discrete culture and you can look at a percentage of that flora. And we're getting pretty close to what other people have recorded. Um, but still, there's only one third of the plants, 164 out of 508, uh, that are actually uh, used or at least recorded for use. So again, potential economic species, almost 40%. Uh, actual, if we combine the data from KCA, you see we get a 12.7%, which actually most ethnobotanists feel comfortable with. But if we just look at individual surveys, you can see the numbers, they're much reduced, 6.4, 4.7, 7.8 because of the close ties, again, going back to my original argument, uh, I think this, we're getting closer to having an accurate reconstruction of the ethnobotanical base. So, getting to the summaries, key points of the use patterns, uh, about 12.7%, almost 13%. That's actually very similar to the floor of South Africa totals where they've looked at how many plants were used based on the flora as a whole, but of course there's many, many different regions in South Africa. Uh, and that's the RSA. Uh, people have, people have, that sound like Donald Trump up here, uh, uh, talking to ethnobotanists who have done field work, somewhere around 10% is often a number that they uh, come up with in terms of a ballpark percentage of the floor that's actually used, but only one third of the native plants, the potential useful plants, were actually used. And 40% of those have been used by some groups. So getting to the conclusions, what kind of evidence do we have for loss of traditional knowledge? And again, we do the best we can with this. Uh, low usage of economic plants within the floor of their historic range. Uh, there are other factors complicating these, but that's certainly a contributing factor. Uh, only 30% of the species recorded for use uh, of potential plants are actually used. So it's most undoubtedly an underestimate what we're coming up with. Obviously, like in any culture, transcultural uh, dispersal of knowledge and resource use is very important. Let's look at the spread of corn. If you need an example, 30% uh, of the exotic flora is used economically. And then many KCA plants were widely used among other tribes. So there was obviously much communication. Mellow lotus, a widely used exotic yellow sweet clover. Second conclusion slide, evidence for underreporting of ethnobotanical data. And I think this may be some of the more significant 
results uh, of interest to ethnobotanies. Uh, we get very low numbers on these individual surveys compared to comparators. Uh, but when we pull it, we actually get a much more reasonable number. So I think there's definite underreporting in some of these surveys. Limited overlap among tribes. Uh, this gets into ethnographic sampling questions. You just can't go in and talk to one person. Imagine if you were interviewed and say, tell me everything about America. Uh, okay. You're going to get a very biased and minimalist subset. So, and lastly, many regional economic species listed in, are not recorded again in the surveys. So I, I kind of almost end here with this picture of Salties again, and this is a shout out to you undergrads. You never know where your undergraduate projects are going to take you. Uh, here's Salties signed up for a summer. Yeah, that sounds good. I can write my senior thesis on that his entire career and it really changed the landscape of science in several disciplines. So there he was, probably 21 years old. That's the morning after a peyote ritual. You'll notice he still has his tie on. <laughs> He's been described as patrician and, uh, and he didn't wear a tie in the Amazon. <laughs> okay, for acknowledgments, uh, certainly, I want to acknowledge the KCA tribes. It's their knowledge and uh, the interactions I've had with them and some of their representatives. They've been very happy to see this uh, data resurrected. Judy Jordan, who wrote that book, has actually been uh, given an honorific title within the Plains Apache tribe. And she brought plants to their attention that they forgot about. It's way back there in the cultural knowledge somewhere. Will McClatchy used to be in Hawaii, then Brit, now he's independent in the Pacific Northwest, helped quite a bit with some of my floristic ethnobotanical analyses. Some colleagues at Oklahoma, Paul Menace, a paleoethnobotanist, and only likes his plants charcoalified. I assume that's not true for the Hort department. <laughs> and a couple of grad students. Dan Mormon, who put together that incredible database, has been very helpful. He's retired now, but he still keeps the database active. Other people help. Uh, Clint Flannery, who uh, oversees the anthro collections at Michigan. All these people were very helpful in putting this together. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you, and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Questions? I have one, Wayne. Yeah. Um, what evidence is there of any of these tribes cultivating any of these plants as opposed to simply gathering them from the wild? Well, many times there is the model. Oh, the, so the question was about were any of these wild plants actually cultivated? I mean, they were mobile people, but at the same time, um, and so they really took careful stock of their resources. Uh, I'm, because sometimes they almost followed a route, they kind of knew where some of the plants were, and it's very possible they did that. Uh, certainly if we look at some examples, it's, it's very common in some cultures for people, particularly like who are theirs or whatever, to transplant plants into a medicinal garden. And some of that may have happened, particularly if there was a, a route in their cyclic uh, mobility so they could come back and knew where certain plants were. So that's likely, but we have no direct evidence of that. That's been a real issue with something like sumpweed, which is really widespread in the archeological record, but it's not reported among many extant tribes at all. It's like they just dropped it. Uh, and then it, it appears in such numbers an archaeological record to make it seem like they were actually, it was like an incipient cultivar. In fact, individuals are actually trying to redevelop some weed. Uh, I have not eaten it yet, but uh, so, but I, I don't have any direct evidence of that. Yeah. In addition to ethnobotanical surveys, did any of the researchers, including yourself, 
look at cultural work, such as creation stories for, for mentions of uh, significant uh, plants or the, or the actual instructions for how to use these plants? Right. So the question is about whether we uh, researchers have also looked into like creation stories or uh, that would incorporate some of these significant plants. And I have not directly. There are several good ethnographic books and investigations of the KCA. Uh, and I have not come across that in some of those. I tried to peruse a lot of that literature. Uh, and a lot of these, even if they're uh, referenced in the native language, that language has at least an English equivalent, so you could check it out. Uh, and I'd have to ask some of my anthropological colleagues for that. I mean, there's a member of the Kiowa tribe on the OU anthropology faculty, for example. They teach Kiowa. I mean, you can do your language requirement learning Kiowa. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of any. Yeah, yeah Jerry. Uh, Wayne, if you look across the range from the plants that are best known that show up in the most surveys on down to the ones that you have the fewest records for, uh, is that axis about the commonality of the plants or are certain types of uses more likely to be showing up in more lists? Well, okay, so the question was plants that are commonly recurring, whether it reflects more that they're very common or they have a, a signif culturally significant use. The answer seems to be more towards the significant component of something. I mean, there's a lot of plants that may be part of the knowledge base, but they may be less desirable. It's kind of like food. There's always going to be preferred food, uh, less preferred food, and then famine food. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the plants that really, uh, I mean, there's like a dirty dozen many times that just keep appearing in all these surveys and because they are so critically important. And corcus is one of them. I mean, in the peyote ceremony, they use corcus leaves, you know, to smoke. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pat, you, talk, you mentioned that. Uh, these the KCA tribes were in three different linguistic groups, but there was probably a lot of exchange of knowledge on usage of particular species. I was wondering if like the nomenclature, the taxonomy, the, the actual, or the names that they referred to those plants got transferred from culture to culture. And if you could kind of come up with the timeline of, you know, that this, that the, Comanche tribe used this plant first, and that name got passed along to the Apache. Was there any cases like that where you could make inferences? Yeah, so the question is about some of the, the naming used by the different tribes, particularly given the fact that they're, they speak languages in three different families. Um, I guess I'm, I have not looked into that, I guess. The way I approach this topic, as you might guess, is as a botanist doing ethnobotany as opposed to an ethnographer doing ethnobotany. Uh, so I have not looked into that. I mean, we have the names and there are uh, experts and even tribal members that are familiar with the language that one could test that. And that would be very interesting to look at. But unfortunately, I. I have not pursued that, that aspect. I think we have time for one more question. Does Geneva have questions? Bill? Yes, Bill. Yeah, uh, how many families are there represented among these plants that they commonly, not only commonly, but entirely use? Yeah. I, uh, I didn't include that kind of information, uh, not on this, this talk, so I have to go into my data archive in my brain. Uh, there's quite a large number in my primary database is all organized taxonomically by family. There's at least 65 families, and that may be a, an underestimate. I mean, things like Rosaceae are very common, and things like Fabaceae are very common, but there are no seeds legume seeds that were used, which 
And there weren't any grass seeds that I, I recorded. And I expected drop seed, Spirobolus, or something like that to pop up as they've appeared in other surveys. So I think those are areas where, you know, uh, some knowledge has been lost. But. If you look at genera, would, be, would there be more sharing of genera among the three tribes and of species? Yes. So, and, and a lot of my numbers are going down to the species level. And sometimes they didn't, you know, it depends on the plant because different species are often referred to as a cousin. So this is a cousin of another prunus. <laughs> uh, and they leave it at that. So there is some information that that's, you know, there's a little bit of error in that data in the sense that they often did not discriminate. Uh, so the, the genus, and that's an interesting point that you allude to or directly allude to, the genus is actually very, very critical element in a lot of non-Western taxonomies. But depending on the, on the plant, this, this species can be important as well. So I want to thank Professor Ellison for a fascinating presentation. Thanks so much. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.